A new study has found that our sun is at least five times less active than other similar stars, which is probably a good thing for the development of life as we know it. A report in the journal Science, based on an analysis of 369 sun-like stars, shows that solar brightness variations are extremely weak, just 0.07% compared to other stars. To the people of Earth, the Sun appears to be an ever-changing star, as it progresses through its 11-year solar cycle. Ranging from very little if any sunspot activity during solar minimum, the area where we are now, and then gradually building up to violent eruptions of solar flares and coronal mass ejections during solar maxima. However, by cosmic standards, our Sun is extraordinarily monotonous. The observations have raised questions as to whether the Sun's lack of significant variation is a basic trait of this particular star, or whether the Sun's simply going through an unusually quiet phase. By examining tree ring and ice core sample records for the distribution of radioactive carbon and beryllium isotopes, astronomers were able to reconstruct the amount of solar activity the Sun's undergone over the past 9,000 years. And from that, they could then infer the amount of sunspot activity taking place and consequently, variations in solar brightness. The isotope readings show the pattern of solar activity to be consistent with what we see today. But then again, just how representative can a 9,000 year snapshot of the sun's activity really be, especially when compared to its present 4.6 billion year lifespan? Or for that matter, the roughly 12 billion years it's expected to be on the main sequence. So to find out, astronomers looked for other stars with similar characteristics to our Sun. In addition to surface temperature, age and metallicity, that is, the proportion of elements heavier than hydrogen and helium in the star's composition, the authors also looked at rotational periods. You see, the speed at which a star rotates around on its own axis is a crucial variable. That's because the star's rotation contributes to the generation of its magnetic field through an internal dynamo process and the magnetic field is the driving force of a star responsible for all fluctuations in its activity. The state of the magnetic field determines how numerous dark sunspots and bright regions on the solar surface are, and therefore how brightly the sun shines. It also determines how often the sun emits solar flares and coronal mass ejections, which can send violent eruptions of plasma and radiation into space, and if they're pointed in the right direction, towards the Earth. Luckily, a comprehensive catalogue containing the rotational periods of literally thousands of stars has been compiled over recent years by NASA's planet-hunting Kepler Space Telescope. Now, Kepler wasn't actually studying stars. It was looking for planets. But it was looking for those planets by recording brightness fluctuations in some 150,000 stars between 2009 and 2013. In some cases, those brightness fluctuations were caused by orbiting planets transiting in front of their host star. For this solar brightness study, the authors selected those stars that complete a full rotation every 20 to 30 days. That's similar to our Sun. They were further able to narrow down the sample using data from the European Space Agency's Gaia Space Telescope. In the end, the authors focused on 369 stars which resembled the Sun in a range of fundamental properties and the exact analysis of the brightness variations in these stars revealed a very clear picture. While active and inactive phases of solar radiance fluctuated on average by just 0.07%, the other stars showed much larger variations, averaging about five times stronger. However, it wasn't possible to determine the rotational period of all the stars observed in the Kepler data. To do this, scientists had to find certain periodically reappearing dips in a star's light curve, which can be traced back to star spots that darken the stellar surface, rotate out of the telescope's field of view, and then reappear after a fixed period of time. But these periodic darkenings can't be detected in all stars, because the signal is simply lost in all the noise of the measured data and in overlying brightness fluctuations. The authors studied more than 2,500 sun-like stars with unknown rotational periods finding that their brightness fluctuated much less than that for the other group. Apparently, when viewed with Kepler, not even the Sun would reveal its rotational period. One of the study's authors, Ben Monte from the University of New South Wales, says the reasons for the differences in activity aren't yet clear. But it would seem that a quiet host star might be an important prerequisite for the establishment of life on any planet in that star's habitable zone. The work we've been doing uh, is using data from the Kepler telescope. So Kepler was a NASA mission that launched in 2009 and 
spent four years observing just one patch of the sky, kind of as big as your hand at arm's length. And it did that every 30 minutes, measuring the brightness of about 200,000 stars, because occasionally these stars have planets, and occasionally these planets are just lined up perfectly along our line of sight to where they would pass in front of the star, and we would see their shadow go across the star. So to do this, to find relatively small planets like the Earth, you need to look at a lot of stars very precisely. So we have this fabulously rich data set of the brightness of 200,000 stars at precision of about 10, 20 parts per million every 30 minutes or four years. And so this is useful for finding planets, but it's also really useful for broader stellar astrophysics. You can see things like star spots on the star. You don't actually image the, the surface of the star itself, but we can see that the star over a few weeks gets fainter and brighter again, just like our own sun does. Yeah, I think they've been using it for astroseismology as well. So there's, yeah, so much, there's such a rich tapestry of data coming from Kepler. Yeah, no, there's, there's really broad science. There's also, there were just, by chance, a few supernovae in the field of view. Mm. Uh, and so uh, there's you know, detailed studies of kind of the initial moments of supernovae from that. But yeah, so I'm broadly, I, I do some work with uh, planets around Kepler stars, but I'm also broadly interested in stellar activity. So understanding magnetic cycles, stellar rotation, star spots, and how those change over a star's life. And the magnetic cycles are important, aren't they? Because that's how you can determine the amount of activity a star is actually outputting, what the star's doing. And that's been important for this research into looking at how the sun compares with other spectral type G-class yellow dwarf stars. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, and we know that we're here around our sun. Is that a coincidence? Is our G stars, is, is there something special about G stars that make them more suitable places for life than other stars? Or is this just, we're here just by chance? Uh, other stars would be equally suitable. We don't really know at this point. Yeah, when we look at red dwarf stars, so everyone <laughs> everyone loves talking about red dwarf stars and the possibility of planets in the habitable zones around those stars because the habitable zones are so close to the star and it's easy to sort <laughs> of spot these planets orbiting around those stars. But red dwarf stars are also very violent places because of their internal structure. They have lots of stellar flares and things like that yeah. which would radiate the surface of any planet. Yeah, they have, they have lots of flares and they last much longer Longer. We know that stars kind of calm down in time, that in the first few hundred million years, stars are much more active than they are after that. But the period that M dwarfs are active seems to be much longer than G stars. And so not only do you have these very large flares regularly from these stars, but they go on for a much longer fraction of the planetary system's life. And so any small planet you know, potentially habitable, could have their atmosphere stripped away before life has a chance to form. I'm working with a student at the University of Chicago right now who's trying to characterize flare rates around M-dwarfs, and one of the things we're seeing is that they just, they're so much more extreme than other types of stars for hundreds of millions of years. Mm, yeah. yeah, they may last longer than the age of the universe, but uh, right. that doesn't necessarily they mean they're destroy, a good place to live. Right, if they destroy all of their planet's atmospheres right away, then... yeah. Uh, even if there's a habitable planet around every one of them, and m are the most common stars, they might all just be completely barren. When you looked at other stars like the Sun, there are a whole bunch of criteria you had. Temperature, rotational rate was important, as we mentioned earlier, and also metallicity, things like that. What did you find in terms of how active they are? Yeah, so one of the things that's interesting to us is that there are many stars that do appear more active than the Sun. We've known that for a long time, but it's potentially things like metallicity or age that drive these differences. I mean, we're just looking at a different sample. And so we wanted to get kind of the cleanest sample we could find and get closest to the Sun in the Kepler field. So we identified the 400 stars that are, as far as we can tell, the most Sun-like, metallicity, and most importantly, rotation rate. We look at stars of known ages and we can see that they slow down in time and their rotation rate is a very reliable proxy for age. That if you find stars that are rotating at around the same speed as the sun and they're about the same temperature as the sun, then they're about the same age as the sun. Mm -hmm. um, and so this is not just a sample of G stars, but a sample of roughly four to five billion year old G stars. And so this gives us really a unique opportunity to place the sun in context and see how its rotation compares or how uh, activity compares to other stars of its type and age. And we found that our sun is quite a bit quieter, that if you look at photometric variability, how much the star gets brighter and fainter over the four years of the Kepler mission, the sun is really boring relative to these other stars. 
That might be a good thing for uh, life, I guess. It might be a good thing for life, yeah. There's a few factors in here. This is, we're looking at star spots, which are correlated with flares, but aren't necessarily identical to flares uh, in terms of their But the calmer the star is, that's probably better for life, the more stable it is. It also gives us the interesting kind of flip side that it's easier to find planets around more stable stars there's less activity to mess up your planetary signals. And so any alien civilizations trying to find planets uh, around other stars, our sun would be one of the easiest targets. As you did your search, there are a lot of stars you couldn't get rotational periods for at all. Yes, that's correct. If you were observing the sun in the Kepler filters, uh, you would see about one part in 1,000 brightness variation over a month. Mm. And there are systematics at the, in the Kepler telescope that inhibit signals much smaller than that. And so we can find fairly short time scale events that are you know, like the size of the Earth going in front of the sun, something like 100 parts per million. But in terms of actually finding long-term signals like star spots, one part in 1,000 around the limit. It would actually be fairly hard to find the sun's rotation period in Kepler data if the sun was in the Kepler field. And so we compare to the stars where we see clear rotation periods, but maybe there are other stars that are sun-like just kind of buried in the noise there. And so we also considered the sample of stars that are sun-like without measured rotation periods. What that probably means is that they're rotating even more slowly than the sun or just have a very small amplitude of star spot signals. And so we looked at those, and even in, uh, compared to those, the sun uh, is very calm. Can you extrapolate anything from that in terms of what this tells us about the need for a quiet place in order for life to grow? We can have two interpretations of our results. The first is that the sun is inherently quieter than these other sun-like stars for some mechanism that we don't really understand. We don't have a good explanation for why it should be quieter. We just see that observationally it is. And so... Maybe this is telling us something about the sun's magnetic field. And we do think there might be some sort of transition that happens in the magnetic fields of solar type stars at about 5 billion years of age. And so perhaps the sun is just in this transition region and it's very quiet for that reason. That's possible. The other explanation is that perhaps the sun is in just a very quiet phase, that there's much more longer time scale of variations. We know that the sun has its 11-year cycle, mm -hmm. um, but there are longer-term signatures in there. There's things like the Maunder Minimum, which went on for a few decades. You see you know, a series of magnetic cycles that are more active than others consecutively. And so we know there are there is variability in the activity of the sun on decadal and you know, century time scales, but perhaps there's tens of thousands of year long time scales as well. Uh, we know from uh, isotopes and radiocarbon dating that the sun's activity has been stable for about 10,000 years, but we don't really know longer than that. So if the sun is just in a boring several millennia and then becomes more active in 50,000 years, that's possible. I take it there's been nothing in, the, in other records that would show any sort of difference in, in how it's affecting life on Earth over periods earlier than that 9,000-year slice that you've been able to get through your ice core and, and tree ring samples. So it's not like there's a sudden change. That's kind of limitation change. of where we are. Yeah, uh, yeah it's, it's hard to look at. We don't have good proxies of stellar magnetic activity going back more than about 10,000 years. Mm. So there's yeah, one of these two scenarios. So in a scenario where the sun is actually much less active, then perhaps that is telling us something about habitability. Certainly we're here, but we don't deeply understand what goes into habitability. You know, a, a quiet star is important, but how quiet do you need? We don't really know, uh, but we're working on it. That's Ben Monte from the University of New South Wales. And this is Space Time. I'm Stuart Gary. Still to come, elongated blobs of molten metals causing Earth's magnetic north pole to move. And later in the science report, positive early results from phase one clinical trials of a new COVID-19 vaccine. All that and more still to come on Space Time. <laughs> 